Welcome everybody. So, given our, uh, what is this theme, something about uh, The Empire Strikes Back, it's compared to mm -hmm. technology, is not necessarily on the side of the rebellion. Mm. Um, <laughs> and uh, for Christopher earlier, just want to let you know, there are other ways thinking about these issues. So, uh, give you a little bit of background in terms of this research and what I'm doing. So, this is part of a chapter in a larger dissertation project looking at the Anthropocene and in the context for the talk today, particularly looking at the intersection of uh, Christian fundamentalism, science debate, and environmental politics. So part of my argument uh, today and the larger project I'm working on is that we need to be thinking about precisely the intersection of these environmental issues, these religious issues, and uh, science issues, particularly since the Anthropocene represents the intersection, um, at least in my perspective, of many of these things. So to give a little bit of sort of background about these sort of three different trends, environmental trends, my argument is basically that we're seeing, and we've heard about this a little bit today, post-natural, end of nature sort of debates, changing discourse about what environmental politics may or may not be looking like in the future. But we're also seeing, um, we talked about this also earlier, post-human um, discussions that play into some of these thinking debates, arguments about our relationship to the environment. But we're also seeing um, increasing risk, something we talked about today, whether we're talking about managed risk, systemic risk, or uh, economic, ecological risk, as they sort of come together. Uh, in terms of the science trends and some of the background, so we're seeing a lot of new knowledge, particularly in the last, say, 50 years, thanks to advances in science and technology, to how we understand science, what kind of science is being done, the emergence of environmental sciences themselves. But at the same time, a lot of these problems that we're seeing that science, particularly the environmental sciences are dealing with, are themselves a result of industrial science coming out of uh, World War II in particular. But we're also at the same time seeing more DIY bio and sort of citizen science. So there's a complicated story sort of going on here, public, private, and uh, in between science. And then finally, religious trends. So this was mentioned earlier, but we're sort of seeing a growth in pagan, animist, shamanic, neo, uh, sort of new age ideas. But we're also seeing a disillusionment with sort of established um, religious practices, particularly in a Western Christian context. But even while that's happening, we're also seeing a sort of growth and rise of fundamentalism, not just in the Christian context, but sort of across the board, monotheistic um, and otherwise. And in many ways, the sort of driving force in a lot of these religious discourses is precisely the fundamentalists, whether we're talking about Islamic fundamentalism, Christian fundamentalism, Jewish fundamentalism, or even as we're seeing somewhere in Southeast Asia, Buddhist and Hindu fundamentalism. So a little bit of background, as I said, this is part of a larger research project that I'm doing, looking at the Anthropocene. And the reason sort of that I got here was particularly my interest in uh, religious movements in general, but particularly how fundamentalism is playing out. Climate change, since a lot of these debates are circling back around issues of climate and climate change. And then finally, this issue, which will be talked about, I think, later, Apocalypse catastrophe, which is a whole sort of part that I'm not talking about today, but in my project, looking at the figure of the zombie as the new uh, risk figure. So the larger argument that I'm making and I'll sort of pose to you today is that what we're seeing is a war of the worlds, but in this case, a war of the world views, since we're a little bit later in generations. And in the way I'm framing this project, the way I'm thinking about the Anthropocene, part of the reason that we're seeing this clash is precisely because of the tensions we're seeing between environmental, political, religious discourses. So uh, for my focus here, this idea, if you believe in an inerrant understanding of the Bible, and the Bible is literally true, there are things that just don't fit with claims about the Anthropocene. There's no way that humans could be changing the climate on the planet, only God has the ability to do that. That's a very blasphemous claim from a very sort of literalist perspective. But we're also seeing challenges to the sort of the theology of wealth, the gospel of wealth, it goes by different terms which I'll talk a little bit more about here later. We're also seeing this idea that humans now can be geologic change agents. We talked about that earlier. But we're also seeing kind of the decentering of the humans as the center. Potentially, we're seeing the decentering of the human as the center of these discourses. Is it about, we talked this earlier, is it we? Who is the we in this context? And then finally, uh, something that Chris talked about earlier, this idea of logics of sovereignty. The state is not able to deal with global environmental challenges. They sort of go beyond the logic of a state framework. So this project and this talk today, sort of the bigger arc is dealing with these issues. And part of what I'm gonna to present today is a somewhat detailed case study of a specific 
instance or practice that I've been looking at, which is the creation of a second category or a dual category of science, historical science and observational science, which will play into, for those of you that are familiar with the Cornwall Alliance for environmental stewardship and their resisting the Green Dragon movement, which I'll talk about, and how this is sort of creating a new fundamentalist, free market fundamentalism, where we're seeing far-right Christian politics and sort of laissez-faire capitalism coming together over the last 20 years. So based on our earlier talk, we heard about <laughs> deep time and uh, geologic history from a fundamentalist perspective. Um, it's nonsense. Mm -hmm. This is the real history of the Earth. Starts maybe 6,000 years ago, maybe 10,000, mm -hmm. depending on how you read Usher and other theological sources. So this is a little hard to see. It's a picture from the Creation Museum in Kentucky where you have Adam and <laughs> dinosaurs playing nice together in the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. Dinosaurs were vegetarian, if you weren't aware, prior to the fall. Mm -hmm. So you can see we have a very different understanding of geologic time that from the discussions in a technical sense of the Anthropocene stratigraphy and those things. It's very hard to do when you're talking about tens of thousands of years rather than billions of years. So part of what I'm looking at is this emergence of this idea of historical science. And I'll talk a little bit more about what this is, but in terms of the genealogy I've been doing, it goes back to, from what I've been able to tell, these two sources, 1984 and 1987 both written by fundamentalist creationist authors with the intent of engaging in evolutionary debates and other science debates with an intent to create a sort of bifurcation, if you will, of science to say there's actually two sciences. There's what we think of today as um, observational science, but there is also um, the second category what they referred to as origin science or creation science or historical science. I'm not going to bother reading these long pieces of text. I'll come back and refer to them. These are sort of the core of how they were arguing. If we want to understand science properly, we need to think about it in two forms. The stuff we can see today and the stuff that happened in the past. So within the fundamentalist literature, a lot of what I've been doing is discourse analysis. For the purposes of today, I'm doing a more visual analysis so you don't have to suffer through lots of slides of text. So we have sort of two contrasting figures here. We have the secular scientists and we have the Christian scientists. And these are characters from one of the earth science textbooks that's published by Bob Jones University. So the idea is essentially that there are two categories of science, historical or origin science. And this emerges out of a supernatural understanding of the world. So God created the earth, six days, Genesis 1, 1 through 2, and other books in the Bible. But it's also kind of split. So you have a supernatural past science and a secular past science. Those two are sort of historical origin science in contrast to this current observational or empirical science. So part of what I'm arguing and I'm trying to trace is how this intervention happened in the 80s and what were the politics behind why would uh, Christian fundamentalists need to create a different category of science and what was it doing today how is it impacting policy, education, laws, um, and the like. So let's just give you an example. This is from one of the books, uh, 2006, called Exposing Biology, uh, Evolution Exposed, the biology textbook. And so you can see here, basically they say, help us understand, we have these two categories, operational or historical, or sometimes called origin, because it deals with the origins of the world, and uh, historical science. So operation, current, verifiable, testable, empirical, regular, Phenomena. It's what we tend to think of as science today. But there's this other category of historical science, which is we weren't there to see it. We can't repeat it. There are these unique singular events, creation of the universe, creation of life. And so the argument is because we weren't there, we can't test that the same way that we do science today. So what I've tried to do is break down how these categories are being created. And the closest that I've been able to come up with is to say that there's this naturalistic historical science, which is where geology and many of the earth science, natural sciences get put into, the supernatural origin historical science. So you have sort of a bipartite division there. And then also operation or experimental science. So this is what we're used to thinking about today in terms of the more common science and then sort of the past science. These are my sort of categories. And you can see sort of the normative claims from a fundamentalist perspective. So this one's bad, it's secular, it's biased. This one's good, and this is kind of the standard. So depending on your political orientations, that last category is probably going to change. So there's lots of examples that I can give folks about how this is happening. It's 
kind of hard to see in this room, but these are a few of the textbooks that are used. So I want to walk through one or two just to give folks an example of how this is actually happening. This published uh, last year at Bob Jones University, Earth Science Textbook, fourth edition. So we see here, this is how science is being described. It's a collection of observations, explanations, and models produced through an organized study of nature. And the process is found in nature for the purposes of enabling people to exercise good and wise dominion over God's world. The word science is also used to refer to the organized methods that produce observations, explanations, and models. And in this context, it's also sort of attached to this idea of dominion science. So humans have uh, sort of a dominion mandate to not only be stewards, but to populate, spread, multiply, um, according to the Bible. So these are some examples from within that bulk of how this idea is being taught. So imagine if you're learning science or being taught science using these textbooks, this is what you're learning. So here's uh, operational science and how this definition um, is being explained. So this comes in the context of about 25 chapters of the science textbook. So this is the first chapter sort of laying out how this operational science happens. So this is kind of research and results that we tend to think of as normal today. They contrast that to historical science, which they define in key ways having to do with larger creationist debates, principles of cause and effect and uniformity. So these go back to um, Augustine, this idea of the first cause or the mm -hmm. unmoved mover, and uh, to Charles Lyell, Hutton, and others, and the idea of uniformity within geological discussions. What we see today can be sort of extended back in time because the process is geologically or evolutionarily for another perspective of the same. Uh, uh, kind of an example, this is a chapter specifically dealing with climate change, environmental issues. So just to give you an example from the one section here. So the idea is that Christian scientists, Christians in general should be scientists, but Christian scientists in particular need to be engaging in these issues. And not only that, but we need to do it from a Christian worldview. So this is part of the reason I'm framing my work in terms of a clash of worldviews, is because this is how it's looked at and talked about within the fundamentalist literature itself. And you'll see here their um, sort of examples. This is Greenpeace uh, stopping a whaling ship, which they describe as uh, operators of the ships like the one on the right resort to violence and other illegal activities to stop illegal whaling in Antarctic waters, whereas the BP oil spill cleanup is what we do to help the creation stewardship mandate. <laughs> um, another example here, this is a, there's lots of kind of featured articles on people. So this is a climatologist. Lonnie Thompson, so an example of how these opportunities play out. So the framing of a secular versus a religious scientist, you see particularly in this sort of last part here, current controversy over climate change highlights how the science and the politics of drives can touch our daily lives. We need more Christians in this field to build solid scientific models based on the true in italics history of the earth, the one found in the Bible. So you can imagine if climatologists doing climate change research think the world is 6,000 years old, it's going to have a different sort of impact on how we read ice cores and how we do a lot of the science. So another example uh, from the same section on climate change, uh, two things that are worthy. So one, they're talking about carbon dioxide and global warming, greenhouse gases, and this sort of pull out here. So carbon dioxide seems to be rising in the atmosphere. People's activities do produce carbon dioxide, but these two facts may not be related to global warming. The problem is not a simple one of a single cause and effect. Natural cycles are causing global warming. There's really not much we can do. If people are causing it, then we need to find out the problem will create outweigh the benefits, so you get the economic uh, rationality here. And then sort of finally arguing, well, there's nothing we can do to stop it, then why do we need to worry about mm -hmm. it at all? And then this really interesting <laughs> chart, if we have scientists in the room, so the sources of greenhouse gas, these are the three top sources. Uh -huh. Natural sources, human activity, and water vapor, which makes up 95%. <laughs> so... It gives you sort of a, and interestingly here, as it says with the caption, pie chart shows the actual contribution humans make to greenhouse gases. By itself, this graph doesn't tell the whole story about the global warming, but it's one factor. There's no way to tell where this information is even coming from in terms of how to evaluate the scientific credit or merits of the argument. So another argument, uh, this is from some of the creationist literature, the journals that are published. This is looking at Tutankhamen, and the essential gist of the argument is, well, there's at least three different theories about how he may have died. Could have been in battle, could have been from disease, could have been something else, which leads them to say, well, because there's all these different theoretical arguments from the scientists, there is no real 
scientific mm -hmm. truth claim. So it goes back to worldviews. Whichever worldview seems best is the one we should pick on. And again, here you see this idea where they're using the operational science or the historical science to help um, explain the way that we can think about um, some of these scientific arguments. And there's lots and lots of examples um, of these sort of playing out. Another example here, looking at this uh, article talking about the relationship between faith and science, um, in particular talking about the way that Christians need to be sort of fighting back. And in particular, the idea that we need to be able to reconcile the Christian worldview with science, but the way we do that is by making science match the Christian worldview. So you see um, some of these same trends. Another feature you see is the featuring of scientists that are also creations to help bring this together. So this is a feature on the nuclear scientist talking about how he's fulfilling God's mandate. Another one here with an astrophysicist talking about creation theories in the galaxy. And there's lots and lots of these. These are just sort of two to give you an example. And then the rest of these are pictures of the way that some of the science is being posed. So this is for middle school science textbook put out by uh, a number of different organizations. Some of the different resources that are part of this awesome science initiative that they had geared towards uh, junior and middle school students. And this is actually a father and son team that produces these videos. So you go to the Grand Canyon and other places and learn about the true history of these areas from a biblical perspective. Uh, some of the different texts you find, so things to do with catastrophes, geologic viewpoints, flood flame work, uh, diluvian theories about the flood. And there's tons and tons of these. You can see I could have put up about 50 different videos that have been produced either by Answers in Genesis or Cornwall Alliance or other groups. Um, another part of the campaign they've been doing are these same as examples. So there's six different ones they've done so far. This is a, the idea is that these two views of science, the scientists look at them, and their worldview determines which they see and which they don't. Same thing here we see with um, evolution and arguments about Darwinism. Uh, for those of you from the UK, the Brits are not excluded from these issues here. The idea of school funding gets brought into evolution. Arguments about should schools be you know, possibly moving towards a more private funded model to get away from state mandated requirements to teach education around evolution um, or sort of other issues. And most of these are from the last 12 or 16 months, so they're pretty recent. Um, outreach to students, try to get students on board, so you're seeing uh, direct kind of advocacy countered at students. Uh, the idea that you know, <laughs> You can be a rebel. Christian scientists, in fact, are rebels because they're on the margins of society. And the uh, Journal of Creation is one of the big sort of peer-reviewed uh, creation science journals that are out there. So just to give you an idea, this is kind of the D, uh, I forget what uh, Orwell called it, but the kind of D brainwashing process where you, your evolutionary views, once you've accepted Jesus and understand the world properly, um, you'll have a better understanding of how these work. And these are all cartoons that are from different journals. So this is in actually in the science textbooks about uh, where oil comes from. So the argument is that, well, there's no way that dinosaurs and plants died and then got compressed and turned into oil and gas and then we harvested. There's no way that makes sense uh, from a biblical perspective. So look how crazy this model the secular scientists have to come up with. So part of what you're seeing is these arguments <coughs> from a Christian fundamentalist perspective have now also started to merge with all of these, and this is just a very tiny list of the many of uh, these right-wing think tanks that are not only involved in climate change, people that were behind the Heartland Institute and some of the East Anglia, um, email scandal, scandals, uh, Climate Gate, and others. So this is, uh, Rolling Stone did a piece a couple years ago focusing on the 17 kind of big climate deniers in Congress and politics. These are some of the speakers from this coming year's mega conference, Answers in Genesis. Uh, one thing that I'm looking at that I'm not talking about here, but is there's a specific uh, gender, class, religious, political um, view. It's largely old, white, conservative, southern men, Protestant, uh, as you can see from a lot of these pictures here. Uh, this is a recent billboard that the Heartland Institute ran for a few days until they got outraged, called, and they decided to take it down. Some of the various media that they produce, some of these also coming from Mormons, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, and others raising these issues. And then uh, you're starting to see the intersection of these fundamentalist organizations, right wing think tanks who are involved in the lobbying, public school, legal advocacy, but also bringing some of these issues together. So, for those of you that haven't seen, if you go to resistingthegreendragon, I think it's .org or .com, 
you'll get a sense of the sort of political propaganda that's being put out, which is specifically turning environmental issues and environmentalism into an anti-Christian sort of project. So now to be an environmentalist is to be living anti-Christian. And you can see different examples of how some of the science, these are all ads from some of the different journals and academic uh, publications, the peer-reviewed Christian journals that are being put together. Hmm. Lots of polls, I won't go through all of these, but for those of you that are interested, there's a lot of really interesting material looking specifically at this rise uh, in public views around religious environmental connections. So yes, all of the polls seem to be suggesting that it's a growing trend in the United States that goes kind of counter. But sort of the last thought is that this is not just a US phenomenon. Christian fundamentalism, the neo-Pentecostal movements, is the sort of the largest growing religious movement in the world today. But what's being exported out to the world is a particular southern US Baptist, Pentecostal, neo-Pentecostal sort of view. So part of what I want us to think about is what would the future of the Anthropocene and environmental politics look like in a rising Christian anti-science, anti-environmental sort of framework? Because that may be part of the future um, of the Anthropocene that we're looking at. All right, thanks. CCMixter.org.